My name is Mark Gardner of Nishigoi TV and I'm here today with Mike Snaden of Yumeikoi uh, here at Yumeikoi's premises in Bristol. Uh, the vat in front of us includes some of the koi that Mike has bought on his uh, recent trip to Japan and some of the tosai that Mike's bought and during this DVD we can discuss those tosai um, the various merits of those tosai and what's made Mike choose them and hopefully through that process um, the viewers you will find some information about how to select tosai, maybe improve your choice of tosai um, that you're looking at to buy um, with a view to growing jumbo, overall quality um, and just getting better value for money really um, so what we're going to do through this DVD is take some of these koi out, put them in a smaller bowl um, so we can then examine them in, in more detail um, look at details very closely of the various um, merits of those koi, various traits of those koi look at various different bloodlines and how that changes how the koi um, may look at this stage but ultimately in the long term um, will improve to be high quality koi so Mike, um, anything more you'd like to add to that? Um, not particularly but just to say that what we've got here hopefully is a, a reasonably broad spectrum of koi uh, not just the best of what we've got but some fish that are cheaper koi and we can reflect on the qualities of those compared to the better kois so that maybe the viewers of this DVD can actually look at those fish and understand why the cheaper fish are cheaper. I think it would be easy to put a whole array of just cheaper fish in there and make those cheaper fish look better by talking about which ones are better, which ones are worse but I think by having high level koi and the cheaper ones kind of intermix with those I think it I think we'll put a, across a better picture of why the good ones are good and why the weaker ones are weak. Okay, so Mike, we have a uh, six kahaku in the bowl here. Um, yeah. Can you give us an indication, first of all, where we've come from? Uh, Matsue Koi Farm and Takigawa Koi Farm in this case. Um, most of the fish are siblings where they are indeed from the same breeder. Um, like the two Takigawa ones are from the same parent set. Um, the others, I think, are predominantly from the same parents, but without actually checking the certificates, I'm not quite sure. But obviously here we can talk about the fish in question and the attributes of the fish in question, um, as opposed to which breeder they're from. Okay, first of all, before uh, we go into a particular fish, when, you, when you're buying, looking for tosai in Japan, or, or people are looking for tosai, What's your personal um, process in terms of what is the first thing you're looking for when you're selecting a tosai? Obviously you're ideally looking for koi that are going to grow big, jumbo koi. Yeah. Um, and I guess first of all we should detail what jumbo koi is in your perspective, from your yeah. perspective. Um, yeah, I mean as you know Mark and I think as probably most of the viewers will understand, I'm very much focused and obsessed with koi that will get jumbo and koi that will become good when they become jumbo. Um, over the years and certainly back in the early days I went through a kind of a phase if you like of buying really small toes like three months old in the summer months um, and then raising those to try and sort of learn and understand those koi um, and also three years worth of sort of breeding and culling in Japan to try and get more insight along the same lines. Um, now for me, as I say, it's all about growing fish jumbo, fish that will become good when they are big. Um, and really one of the primary things when I'm actually buying fish, I'm looking for fish of bloodlines that I like, um, obviously the genetics to get big, the patterns that I personally like and qualities that I like. Um, but more importantly, is a way of looking at it in such a way that if I buy these fish and I put them in our ponds here, what's going to happen, let's say next year or the year after and so on, will I be in a position that I, I will want those fish to still be swimming around here or will there be fish that I will want people to pick up and take home as soon as possible? Um, so what I'm saying is that every time I buy fish, I'm asking myself the question, what happens if this fish doesn't sell in this season? Um, it's got to become basically bigger and better so that in the case of expensive fish, you don't end up selling them at a loss. You end up hopefully whereby, if it's expensive, okay, fair enough. But in the future, with any luck, if that fish is expensive and nobody buys it, then maybe as Nisai it becomes worth that price as Sansai or Yonsai, um, it will kind of eventually grow into the price tag. Everybody knows really that with sort of high level Tatigoi, Tosai or Nisai for that matter, 
you are actually essentially paying a future price for that fish. You're paying for what the breeder's dream, if you like, is for that particular fish. Um, so sometimes, because you're paying a future price, you do need to actually make that fish grow and become that future price, if you like. Okay, so in terms of jumbo, um, from your perspective, what, what's a jumbo koi? To me, it's got to be 85 centimetres upwards. Um, ATCM, I think, certainly isn't jumbo. Jumbo, to me, is something that can compete for grand champion or mature champion, jumbo champion, let's say, in the koi show. Um, so if it's not big enough to, to realistically compete at that level, then I think you can't really regard it as being jumbo. So I think these days it's got to be 85 plus. So when you're in Japan and you have a pond of tosai in front of you, um, what's the first thing you're looking for? Um, when people judge koi, we talk about judging uh, body shape and skin quality, pattern being the last thing apparently. Um, for you personally, what, what's your first thing you're looking for when a breeder offers you a pond of koi or they're going through those koi? I'm looking for koi, and there's another reason actually, one of the fish in here will reflect what I'm about to say, but koi that are of an ideal size in relation to their siblings. Um, if all the fish, let's say, are from a particular breeder, all of his best ones are 40 cm, there's no point in buying ones that are in the same pond that have been raised at the same rate that are only 30 cm, because quite obviously they're clearly not, not going to make that kind of size. Um, some people would say that all the fish end up the same size in the long run, but it's simply not true. Um, what you'll see is that those smaller fish have actually got different frames, different body types, different head shapes and so on to the bigger ones. You can see why the bigger ones are bigger. Um, so that is really, I think, quite evident when looking at upon the fish. So I'm looking for really fish that are a decent size in relation to the siblings, fish that have got the right kind of body type that I think can grow big, fish that have got the right kind of body type that I think when it does get big, it can carry its body well, it can carry decent volume, um, it'll have a nice belly line to it, a good sort of weight distribution. I don't like fish that are too thick and heavy across the shoulders, I don't like fish that are too fat further back. It's got to be a really nice body line all the way through. And whilst I don't get it right all of the time, I think that the success rate of us getting it right here I think is particularly good. Um, but I've got to kind of really try and focus on those attributes that I think are going to achieve what I want to achieve. Obviously, if I compromise on what I'm looking for, um, and maybe I say, okay, this body's nearly good enough, or this quality's nearly good enough, essentially what I've done, I've painted myself into a corner whereby maybe after one year, those fish have got to be sold cheaper than what I actually paid for them in many cases. So you do need to kind of focus on what you're doing and stick to it rigidly. So in that respect, things such as um, the, the sashi, the kiwa, the, the pattern, the skin quality, are the latter things that you're looking at personally um, your first priority is to find a koi with the right the bone structure body shape etc it is and naturally like everybody else i'm also kind of drawn towards nice patterns um, so you look at a pattern you think well okay you know this is good the pattern's nice but if the pattern's good but everything else is weak then to me i'll just walk away from it i would rather compromise on pattern um, get something that's simple or maybe something a little bit quirky on a fish that's got the right technical attributes rather than look first at the pattern and then say okay the rest of it's not ideal but it will do because that kind of fish I think will always disappoint if you're buying fish as a hobbyist for example I think if you compromise on the pattern you'll have something that just won't grow up into what you'd hoped it would become whereas if you compromise in the first place on the pattern but you make sure that all well, the qualities are right and the bodies are right while she might not like the pattern, I think when that fish gets big and becomes jumbo 80, 85 cm, you'll look at the, hish, in, at the fish in a completely different light. You'll look at something and say, wow, that fish is so imposing or so beautiful and I feel so proud of what I've done with the fish. Um, so you might find a fish, let's say, where the pattern perhaps is imbalanced or not that interesting, but as a big fish, it becomes a completely different prospect to actually look at every day. Okay, so... Uh, it, it there's a, a well-known saying in Japan um, that koi keeping begins and ends with kahaku and I think it's pretty fair to say with kahaku um, we can see lots of things in kahaku that, that we can carry through to different varieties. Is that something you would agree with? Yeah, I think so. Um, certainly in terms of, let's say, skin and body types and so on, um, that side of it I think you can carry through to other varieties. And as far as things like kiwa and sashi goes, you can also carry that through to sanki and shoru as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, there is a lot of similarity. I think for me, Kahaku is 
It's not easy to get it right when it comes to growing fish up jumbo, but it's easy to get it right more often um, than with Sankey or Showa. So for me, yes, it begins with Kahaku, it ends with Kahaku, but for me, it's Kahaku in between as well. It's just what I kind of like best because it's more easy, I think, to become satisfied um, with raising a Kahaku to what you hope it will become. So I think if we if we start with the largest koi in, the, in this bowl, the one at the end there, um, the three step with the, the yeah. interesting or unusual head pattern. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of like, an, oh, in terms of patterns, I, for me pattern is a, a, a big priority. I've got to like the pattern first, yeah. um, but then I accept that the other factors come into it. Um, I find it difficult to compromise on pattern. Yeah. Um, but, and I, I kind of, I, I group patterns as being simple patterns, such as simple Nidan, Sandan, hmm. two, three, four step patterns. And then we have quirky patterns. Um, and this largest coin in the bowl, uh, you just get a close look at it there, Mike. Yeah. Is, is kind of almost a, a standard three step pattern, um, but it's got a very interesting difference in the fact that it's got a very unique head pattern. I think the head pattern is as you say, it's quite unique. I think very attractive, um, unusual. I think with this koi, the pattern otherwise is sort of relatively simple, but I think the body type is particularly strong. I think this koi really, in all fairness, should become the biggest fish out of everything in the bowl in the future. It should be easier to grow quicker. So maybe let's say as five or six year old, um, I think size wise, you might actually look at it and say, well, growth wise, it's like a year ahead of the other ones in terms of size. And this particular fish is from which breeder? This one's from Matsue, uh, Matsue Koi Farm. But I think this particular fish, I think the body type in terms of height, um, the actual head profile, if you like. One thing I kind of look for when I say head profile is the way that the head runs into the shoulder. I don't like heads that go shallow. I don't like heads that go shallow above the gill covers either, on either side of the head. Um, and I like the head where the profile of it is kind of high enough and strong enough that it runs smoothly into the shoulder. You don't get a step, you get a continual run through the shoulder that then raises up through the back of the fish. And I think in this term, this one is particularly nice. Also, I think in terms of size potential and body in the future, this kind of look to the backbone is really good. That kind of really strong, thick backbone, almost slightly hollowed out either side of the backbone. I think this kind of fish is very easy to get big, but also very easy to put a nice body shape on when the fish is big. Okay, so, in terms of, is that something you would put this, this koi as being the number one koi in the particular bowl? Or? In actual fact, I would say no. Um, I think in terms of size, I think it's the strongest prospect. Um, but in terms of an overall package, no. Um, it's really, I think it's one of those fish that I said earlier, it's a compromise. You're looking for all the technical points that are good, but compromising on the pattern. Um, the style of the fish isn't quite so valuable. Um, but technically, it is a really good fish. Okay, so having got to that stage now, let's uh, have a look at the, num the number one fish from your perspective, please. Um, in my perspective, really, um, this fish, I think is the best overall. In terms of the balance between pattern, body type, quality, kiwa, sashi, and skin quality as well, I think this one really, to me, has got everything. Um, this is one of the two Takigawas in the bowl. His kind of regime, if you like, um, for raising fish, results in the fish not being so big as Tosai. Um, and I've heard people in the past, um, via the wonders of Facebook, kind of question the genetics of the breeder. Um, you know, people that have perhaps thought that, oh, well, maybe Takigawa's fish aren't really quite so capable of growing jumbo. Um, maybe he hasn't got the genetics, but really it's just his raising technique. But I think this fish, for me, I really like the bloodline of this fish. Um, the parents of this fish on both the female and male, male side I really like. Um, and then when it comes down to the individual fish, what I really like is the actual body type of the fish. Um, the development, if you like, of the actual bone structure of the fish isn't quite so advanced um, as the Matsuei three-step that we just lifted. Um, but I think this one is, it is particularly good. Um, and I think later on, let's say as Nisai, you will see this fish build its frame up more. It will become stronger, more evident that it will become big. Um, but what I also like with this fish is the overall pattern and the balance between the front and rear half of the fish. Um, you've got a fish here whereby the head pattern, if you like, is slightly bald, um, 
slightly receding if you like. Um, but I think that balances with the amount of tail stop that you've got on the fish as well and I think that's really nice. Um, the Maritan marking you've got is kind of off-centre. It's um, complemented by the off-centre shoulder marking as well on the opposite side. And I just think this style of fish I think is really, really nice. Some breeders also feel that although, let's say, UK hobbyists don't like colour that runs into the dorsal, some breeders are of the opinion that where you've got fish where the colour's running up at the rear of the dorsal into the fin there, they think that that's actually a good indication um, of how long or how robust the colour's going to last um, later on in life. So it's something that to some degree breeders kind of welcome. If you've got a fish where may, maybe the colour doesn't run into the dorsal whatsoever, um, there is that chance as a feeling with some breeders, as I say, that the colour's not so um, strong and robust, it won't last so long. And what you should see with a fish like this is that when the fish grows up and gets bigger, maybe not in the next 12 months, but certainly let's say through the Yonsai, where you've got the white tip to the dorsal fin at the top there, you should find that that colour will actually slowly pull down and recede, which will just make the fish look better as the fish gets older. Yeah, certainly. I think red in the dorsal fin is something that uh, causes lots of hobbyists a big problem. Um, um, more of a problem for hobbyists than it does for breeders, certainly that's something I've experienced as well. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, the general consensus seems to be is as long as the red doesn't come right to the very edge of the, the dorsal fin, yeah. um, then it will generally see that. And as long as you then, if you look at the koi from above and you have a solid white stripe along the back, yeah. that's what's appealing. It doesn't, ha doesn't matter that the red actually runs up into the dorsal fin. No, that's right. I'd agree with you completely. Um, and for sure, breeders do tend to feel the same way. I mean, it's like the three step that we first talked about as well. You can see that that color does ride up quite high in the dorsal, but it doesn't go all the way to the top. You'd have that kind of white pencil line running all the way down from end to end, if you like. Um, so this section that is quite sort of dominantly red um, should recede very easily as the fish grows up. Okay, on, the, on the second colour we just looked at there, Mike, um, you mentioned that the, the, the frame wasn't quite so advanced. Yeah. What are, you, what are you really saying there? In what respect would the frame be less advanced than, than the first colour we looked at? Um, I think where breeders kind of raise koi more intensely as tosai, they tend to build the frames up quicker on the fish. So you'll generally feel, see that bigger jumbo tosai generally speaking, have got stronger frames. I'm not talking about siblings from the same breeding, I'm talking about different breeders altogether. If you get a breeder that is kind of very old school, he's not too fussed that the fish get jumbo as tosai, and maybe he only produces, let's say, 28 cm or 30 cm tosai, you'll find that the body types actually appear to be an awful lot weaker than a breeder that maybe is producing 40 cm tosai. Um, but I think the end result, when the fish actually eventually get big, the frames may actually be very com comparable between those different breeders' fish. Um, so a frame on a fish is something that you are kind of building up and creating as you grow the fish. Now, on that topic, I mean, looking at these two Takikawa fish in this instance, we've got this one here, this other one that's just swimming past the other way. Um, this fish, I think, this pattern, I think, is particularly nice in the future. If you can imagine this fish as a balancer pattern, as a jumbo fish, I think this would look fantastic. Um, and again, you've got a very good balance between the front of the fish and the back of the fish. The colour comes further down the face, but also the tail tube has got a, a tighter tail stop as well, but very nice. Um, you've got a pattern that's not too simple. You've got your first step running up a little bit one side of the shoulder second step one side of the shoulder, the next step then falls down the other side of the fish. And I think that kind of style of fish is really nice. But comparing this to the other Takigawa, the body type's very different. If you look at this one, you've got a body that is a little bit thicker. You've got more height to the back of the fish. Um, and this is particularly nice. Um, and then if this Takigawa one here, the actual height profile of the fish is a lot shallower and also the belly line. So if, if you looked at it, it's kind of like, um, if you looked at it as a cross section, the body type on the second Takigawa one is a little bit more like looking down um, a length of hose. It's a lot more circular in its profile, whereas this one is a lot more kind of elliptical. It's a lot higher in its profile, um, and the backbone kind of as it comes up comes to much more of a point as it were on the back of the fish. Um, so this is a very different sort of prospect, size-wise as it were. And the Benny very, different as well. 
Um, I think this one's Benny is a little bit redder, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I don't think that's necessarily going to have an awful lot of bearing on the fish when it grows up. Um, but time will tell. But I think this fish, I think, Kiwa and Sashi style and colour, I think, is really, really nice. Um, but the, ta the other Takigawa, I think, has... It's got the edge, not massively different, but I think the edge that when the fish grows up, it will end up being a much better, better package later on in life. Okay, so we've sort of spoken about three of the core here. Another yeah. one swimming straight in front of you there, Mike, the four step. Yeah. Um, very simple pattern. Yeah, I think this is kind of, if you like, the most popular pattern out of this lot. Um, this is a kind of fish that everybody's going to like. People just love four steps. Um, and I think where you've got this kind of sort of two bigger steps as you go in down to where the body's more delicate on the fish, the steps are kind of getting smaller. I think that kind of style looks really good. Um, the steps are all kind of in keeping with each other. Um, and I think in that respect, that's probably the most popular pattern. Um, but for me, as an overall package, I would prefer this fish. Um, the pattern's not so nice, but I think the body's that little bit better, and I think as a big fish, um, I think this will end up being more predictable to get big, but I think as a big fish, this kind of pattern with more bulk on will just look a lot more interesting than it does right now. Yes, yeah, certainly. I, I would tend to agree with that. It's what we generally term a, a big fish pattern. It is, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think a lot of people, when they talk about big fish pattern, they kind of, in a way, mean really, really boring patterns. But what I think you would think along the same lines as me, I'm pretty sure, um, a, big fat fish, sorry, a big fish pattern in this case, I think is something that whereby the pattern looks very simple. But it's what actually creates that big fish pattern is the way that the pattern kind of meanders up and down along the dorsal line. Um, because although it looks simple now, if you imagine this same fish as a jumbo fish, whereby anything basically above the pattern, uh, sorry, above the dorsal line, um, sitting more on top of the fish, will effectively get pushed up more, which then exposes more white ground. Um, the pattern doesn't change, but it's just the perception of the pattern looks different because that body's kind of bolt up and a lot of the pattern's getting pushed up. And then likewise, where some of the pattern wraps below the dorsal, sorry, below the... <laughs> um, the lateral line. The lateral line, sorry, yeah tongue-tied for a moment there, but where some of the patterns are wrapping deeper down the lateral line, um, effectively that pattern will get kind of pushed down deeper because it will get hidden a little bit more by the bulk in the body. So as a big fish pattern, this will look a lot more interesting than it does right now. Yeah, very much so. I, I, yes, I would, I would agree with exactly what you were saying. There. Um, which leaves us with... One the... fish. Um, this fish. Now, the reason that this fish is in the bowl um, is that there's nothing particularly wrong with a fish, but it's not an outstanding fish. Um, this, when I was saying earlier, if the fish is expensive, obviously you've got to strive for perfection with that fish. If the fish is cheap, you've got to say, well, okay, there's a compromise to be made here. It's cheap for a reason. And this is a cheap fish, but it's a sibling of the likes of this and this. Um, and you can see the fish are dramatically smaller um, the colour's not got the same kind of thickness to it, the skin's not the same either. If you look at the skin of the fish, you can see it's almost slightly pink. You can almost see the flesh underneath. It's not got the kind of same thick, creamy kind of look to the white. It is a lot more... A lot of people, I think, in the UK, for instance, would look at the fish and say, oh yeah, the skin's fantastic. But it might be just skin condition. It might be just the fact that it looks really white. But when you look at a better sibling, um, with skin that, let's say, is not so white, it's maybe more creamy, it's also a lot thicker. And at the end, end of the day, as a big fish, this kind of skin is much, much higher quality. It's a lot more solid. The surface tissue on top of the scales is thicker as well. So you don't get that kind of translucent white look that this fish has got. So what you're really looking at here is a fish that's really about a third of the price. But it's a third of the price for good reason. Uh, because it just simply doesn't have the same kind of future as any of the other fish in the bowl. So some of the things, some of the more detailed things we've perhaps not spoken about, um, for example, um, if we get onto the, the skin and the, uh, the sashi and the kiwa. Um, um, yeah, I mean, with this fish, the cheaper one, um, you could look at it, let's say, with a whole bunch of other fish of the same size and same quality, 
and then the fish would look a lot better because you'd be looking or you know your average hobbyist is going to be looking at a load of fish that are very comparable um, and because they're comparable they might well pick this fish out as being the best one of the bunch and say oh this is fantastic but this sachet on the shoulder is not so good the actual style of the sachet not the depth but the style of it how uneven it is across the scales um, and also the sachet on the back end here is a little bit too deep now to my mind when i'm choosing fish that are going to become good tatty goy or good fish of the future what's more important to me is not the sashi depth but the sashi style how even it is and how kind of in keeping it is in the various areas of the pattern um, people quite often say that sashi with um, toe size is unimportant but for me i think it's incredibly important i think it's completely sort of underrated and i think maybe dealers if you like that perhaps feel that it's unimportant are really just trying to sell the fish um, and that's all that really matters you wouldn't find the dealer actually keeping that fish and trying to grow it into something good later on um, now one thing i think when you're looking at sashi that i think is quite important um, is really sort of how it looks at the back end of the fish and how it looks at the front end and what i'm saying here is that um, with tosai for example you'll generally find that the sashi on the tail tube i think as an ideal will tend to be shallower than the sashi, let's say on the shoulder area um, with this one it's not so much the case but what i'm saying is if you imagined a fish let's say with this kind of sashi on the tail tube or very tight sashi and then for example that same fish has this kind of deeper sashi right on the shoulder area so just suppose um, this fish had let's say deeper sashi on the tail tube on this four step um, but deeper sashi on the shoulder area what you'll find is the sashi on the tail tube doesn't tighten up in the same way that the shoulder does and the reason for that being is that the surface skin on the scales on the shoulder area and also the scales themselves actually become thicker than scales around yeah, the tail tube area so you'll find that where a fish maybe has got sashi that looks a little bit deeper around the shoulder um, you'll get away with that but if you have the same kind of look to the sashi on the tail tube in that area you won't get away with it and it's actually quite common to see um, when you get to the back end of koi like that. Um, wide sashi at the tail tube is actually quite common. Yeah. Um, on, on koi, um, and there's a, there's a lot of kahaku you do see where yeah, it like very this. much spoils. This is spoils very deep. An, an otherwise yeah. very good koi. Yeah. And then you get to the last, the last down, the last step of the pattern. Um, at the back of the koi and that sashi is very t is very much too deep. That's right. I mean if you look at this one here you can see particularly I think at this kind of angle that that sashi is very deep in the, on the tail tube and I think as a fish gets big this sashi will never become really tidy. The area on the shoulder on the other hand I think yeah that will tighten up a lot but what you'll find is a couple of these areas literally on a couple of scales um, will stay too uneven. So although most of the sashi on the whole on this will get shallower and tighter a couple of parts of it just won't look quite right. It just won't have the same kind of refinement. If we turn that course to the other side, Mike, um, got a very narrow band across the shoulder there. Yeah. yeah. Um, we often see koi like that and people say, oh, it's going to join, it's going to break. Yeah, for me, it kind of depends on the quality of the fish. I think if people tend to look at things i find and say oh do you think it's going to break and they tend to think it's going to break more often than not but to, in my experience let's say looking at this fish here that kind of narrow gap in the pattern you're more likely to see it actually join up than become wider later on i think if the color's really good what happens is if the quality of the color is good you'll find that the keyword kind of creeps backwards it creeps into the food in a little bit and then you'll also find that as the fish gets bigger and the fruit develops on the sashi side of it, the colour kind of creeps forward into the fruit in there as well. So you could end up with, say, this fish here later on. I don't think it will in this case, but later on I think it could end up virtually touching, almost joining up. If the fish has got a gap that's becoming wider, I think it's because actually the fish is losing colour, um, which is not such a good thing. So if you've got a fish, let's say, with harder colour, um, and really kind of let's say more aggressive kiwa, more marizomi kiwa, less straight cut kiwa, and also really really tight sashi, you'll find that kind of koi can actually develop a break in the pattern or, or a wider gap in the pattern and the reason is because it's not going to last, it's going to fall apart. Anything that I think has got the right kind of genetics, the right kind of sort of colour and qualities and so on, you'll find it will do the reverse, it'll end up getting a, to become a closer gap. Okay, so uh 
I guess that pretty much covers these kahaku, other than we have six fish in the bowl. Um, perhaps we can go through and give you a grading, for, or not grading, but a, a, a first place koi through to a, a sixth place koi with a bit of an explanation as to, to why they would be that way in your opinion. Well, in this case, for me, it would be this one first. Um, as I mentioned before, that slightly bald head pattern matching really with a slightly bald tail too, but I think this kind of fish, as a big fish, is just going to become beautiful. Body tight's really nice, pattern's really nice. The overall kiwa, sashi and so on, I think is a really nice combination. So that for me is all around the most kind of desirable one. Um, second to that, I would pitch this one. Um, although I think this fish, it's a different breeder. I think it's a little bit more predictable as far as size goes perhaps, but I think as an overall package, I think this is to me second place. Um, as overall kind of desirability goes. For me, for me, that's probably number one. I yeah. Um, there's aspects of the, the pattern of the first one that don't particularly appeal. Yeah, for me, I really like the style of the first one and it might not be everybody's choice and a lot of people don't like bald fish, if you like, bald patterns on the head, that kind of thing. But for me, I can forgive it because it's in keeping with the rest of the pattern. Um, but I can quite understand why you like this one best. And uh, this one I think is, where it's bigger and that body type is a little bit more progressed, it is a more predictable fish for getting jumbo. Um, I don't necessarily think it will actually get bigger, but I think it is more easy to look at it and say, you know what, I feel really safe about this one. Um, so for me, it's like a close second um, to that other one, but it is just personal taste in this case. Um, this one I think is third, the four step. Um, I think it is just really, really easy to like, and it is sort of pretty much perfect everywhere. So I think that one is, I think, the third place. Um, and then fourth place, I think we're down to this one, the three-step. I think everything technically is really good. Um, the sashi is a little bit deep, as you can see there, and also on this other side. But I think this kind of sashi, although it's slightly deep, it fades away to nothing at the front edge. It's kind of discreet as to where it fades away. I think that kind of sashi and the style of what you can see that surface color that's there, it's really easy for that sashi to become refined later on. It's really easy to tidy up. So this kind of style of sashi, not the depth, but the actual style of it, is really easy to become good. Um, and then after that, we're down to this one, which I think the pattern's really nice. Um, but I think it's just not got the same kind of body structure. Um, and also that color I think is kind of slightly harder, maybe slightly thinner. Um, but I think the style of the fish is great but it's just not so well rewarded, if you like, in the technical points. And then this one, really, um, which is okay if you're looking for a cheap fish, but if you comp compare this fish to the other fish in the bowl, this is very much Tatesta. There's nothing Tatigoy about this whatsoever. Some people might say, oh yeah, it's Tatigoy because it will get better, the sashi will get tighter, but a breeder would look at this all day long and they would be thinking, okay, I need to sell this, it's got to go. I don't want to put it in a mud pond, it's just got to sell.